Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone, for another hot hey. day Q&A. Yes, yes. These come regularly. They do. I know. Every week, someone might even think. We're, we're being pretty good at not skipping anymore. But that doesn't mean we're not going to skip again. It just means... <laughs> I was going to say, stop promising things we can't <laughs> I know, we know, we know, sorry, sorry. We're 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 pretty good at not skipping. I'm, Let's I'm, put it that way. My um, I've got a bit of a headache today, so my cognition is going to be low. So I'm I'm assuming my answers are going to be less than less than perfection. I'm afraid. So your you know, IQ is down to is. 140 now. Huh? Is that I know, what it is? I know. <laughs> uh, the, you're, from one, you're almost 165. It's down to that, 140. Right? It's just knowledge <laughs> stuck in there somewhere. Um. So uh, we should go through the, the usual stuff. So Scott's not here today. Yeah. So um, let's, uh, let's Scott, we our... miss you. Have a, have yeah. a fun back vacation. To Scott. Scott's on yes. vacation, and he's, he's going to turn into a red crab on the beach. So uh, have yeah. fun, Scott, and uh, we'll see him yes. when he gets back. Let's, let's go for the usual stuff. So welcome to the stream. Okay. We're going to be talking about compilers and interpreters today and yep. uh, answering your questions, of course, as always. So uh, my name's Simon Lightfoot, Plot the Community Leader. CTO of Dev Angels London, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dev Angels London. Randall. And I'm Randall Schwartz. I'm a Dart and Flutter Google developer expert, which means I've been vetted to try to give mostly non-wrong answers most of the time. <laughs> and uh, I also spend a lot of time uh, going over the questions on Discord and Reddit and Stack Overflow and the Slack channels. Uh, and try to answer as many as I can. So you'll see me everywhere. That's part of my job. And I have uh, also a, uh, a YouTube channel for all my great uh, Dart and Flutter videos, but we'll plug that later on in the day. Um, and I'm also, for this show, I am watching the live chat, looking for Q colon in the front of a line, and I will mark that so that the two of us... Yes, there we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you there, uh, Simon. Um when you mark it that way, I pick it out, I, and then I put it in the queue for us. We may not get to it immediately. Don't repeat the question. We've seen it. It's okay. Yeah. It's just sometimes it's in a queue, and we haven't gotten if to it. If you don't put so queue, there's repeat. no guarantee we're going to see it. We do try and see yeah, them it, otherwise, but you know, there's no guarantee. Right, and also, if you don't put queue, it might just be that you're discussing amongst each other because the chat room does that a lot. So unless it's prefixed by Q, it won't be a question to us. That's really the rule there. Um, okay. Sorry if there's a bit of an echo there. I think I had something going on. Anyway, um, so uh, let's see now. So we need to go through one last little thing on on, on our start. Oh, yeah. and, uh, we'll do some don'ts, do, right? Do, do some don'ts. Let me just jump into this quickly. So, uh, okay. yeah, do some don'ts. Be nice, respectful, construct, uh, constructive whilst interacting on the YouTube live chat, social media. Just be nice, you know, understandful. Um, don't post anything adult content rude, offensive, you know, don't advertise, promote anything. Uh, do not spam, post anything again and again. We've just been through this. And any harassment is not tolerated in any way. And failing any of this code, uh, you'll be blocked for interacting with this chat and potentially other sorts of chat like Discord and other places where, where the Flutter community shares its ban list. So uh, you have been warned. Right, moving on. That's the that's the horrible out of the way. Let's get back to the fun bit. So, um uh we were talking last week around uh we got into a bit of talk about compilers and interpreters and we yeah thought, oh, you know what we could do something this week um i think i think, think let's let's i mean there's a general thing around the fact that you write this code in in english in, in english for instance you type it in your keyboard right and suddenly that turns into some some something the computer understands and it runs this is compilation, right? Like the idea of taking source, what you type, yeah. and turning it into machine code, which is eventually the ones and zeros that the computer understands. Um, now, interpreting is essentially the same thing, but it happens at runtime. So as you type something in, and normally this can happen in various ways. So you have a REPL, which is kind of like a command prompt kind of notion, which Perl, does, does Perl have like a command line interface? I know. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you can go into the debugger with an empty program, and it, you yeah. basically get the same thing. And you get, um, you've got, you've got PHP and um, Lisp, and a few of the other kind of things have like a, a this kind of command prompt style where you can type in your code, and then it will. I think think with PHP you had like a something on the command line, and it starts like a prompt, and you can do like an interactive mode, right? And what that does is yeah. as you type stuff in, it then it does what the compilation would normally do, which is to interpret it and then run it. 
Now, in you use the word REPL without describing it. Read, uh -huh. eval, print. Uh, what's L? Line feed? <laughs> what is that? Um, it doesn't matter I, then. I mean, look it up. Let's literally, literally have to look that up on Wikipedia. I'm going to do it right now. I <laughs> got you. Got you distracted already. Let's see. Yeah, I know, right? The show. <laughs> uh, my 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 typing is good. Yeah, I'll read eval print loop. Oh, loop, loop. Yeah, because you're doing it for each loop. Each. I am your father, loop. So okay. there you go. So so yeah, that's what we're talking about. I'll pop that link in the chat. There you go. Oh look, look, yeah. He's got loop in the chat already. Someone, someone's, someone's on top. <laughs> so um, the 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 other thing is uh, back nor I, I quit back Norris form, and that's not how you pronounce it. BNF, BNF. Um, so I mean, we, we're skipping a little bit here, but I just want to pop some links in the chat for people to look up and reference. So uh, let me uh, maybe I can share this on the stream. Let's bring this up on the stream back to make these yeah. interesting. BNF. Uh, let's share this. So this is the. Let me get this up on the stream. There we go. No, that's the wrong thing. Oh, uh, that's go. okay. You might want to uh, make it slightly bigger, one bigger or two. There we go. That's right. right. <laughs> it just didn't too tiny for me to see. Yeah, so I'm just trying to organize here. Bear with me. Yeah, we're going to be moving things around today. It's going to be an interactive stream today. So yeah, so um. Uh, Bacchus normal form, I guess the Bacchus nor form. I don't know. Anyway, um, BNF is is literally this kind of set. It's a set of rules as as like this. You're basically saying symbol equals expression, right? And you have terminal non terminals, something that ends and something that continues. And here's an example here for a US postal address. So what this is saying is a postal address has a name part followed by a street address followed by a zip part always. And the name part is the personal part followed by last name followed by optional suffix and then an end of line or personal name part post personal part followed by name part and then each one of those breaks down and so on and so forth and that's it like like you know the, from this set of of um simple rules you can define quite a few different uh, grammars shall we say and what's interesting about this syntax is that it's pretty much industry standard i mean there are yeah extensions to it for certain conditions but generally if you learn to read this you're going to be able to read lots and lots of specifications where this is the the normative form for this, it to understand this is like the, the standard form in all of the um oh god i'll tell you my brain's not working uh request for comments rfcs all, all, all yeah. of the rfc documents from from the internet engineering task force use uh bnf and in its format of explaining things um yep. whenever it has like a, a protocol or an api or that kind of stuff um so yeah you, you can and here's the translation of english was i wasn't reading this off but that's basically what i was saying <laughs> about what this means you can go read this up anyway and then there's obviously yeah wikipedia has all the history and everything but the the, the, the main part is what we just explained where you have like that kind of um expression so i mean here's a good example of this like an integer is a digit followed by uh followed by uh, is a digit or an integer by a digit now if you think about that it's a loop right so you can say it's digit followed by any other set of digits right there's also um so you can actually sort of break these down i'm trying to remember there's 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 a sort of some simple ones with um I might see if I can find it actually. Hang on. Um, like interpreting like a symbol in, in a piece of software, it always has to start with a letter. You might realize in Dart you cannot start with a number. Like so when you have like uh you know a variable name, it cannot start with like number one followed by some letters because it thinks it's a number, <laughs> right? And that's because of these rules. It has to start with a letter and then it can be concatenated or followed by a, a number, but not the other way around. And the same goes with like how it determines if something's a dub or a float. Well, has it got a a, a period in it? If it has a period in it, uh, then that means it's it's a decimal place, so it's a floating point number. And I'm sure you're going to make this point later, Simon, but I'll go ahead and make it right now okay. anyway. You can look at that integer is either a number. Oh, back, mm -hmm. You scroll away from it. Ah. Yeah, I'll go back. Yeah. So you can look at that and almost implement a recursive descent parser directly from it. 
So you would write something that recognizes a digit. You'd write something that recognizes the integer as being either that matches or it calling itself and then that matches. And it's it it sort of lends itself to a structure for one type of compiler. There's, I mean, this, yeah, you've got. Um, I don't go too far into the whole sort of mix of yeah. what types of. <laughs> the, 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 as you said, recursive descent compilers. You've got bottom up, top down, left right, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's a lot. I'm trying to find actually. I had some reference material. I. I Let's see if I can find it here. Um, bear with me. Um, but the one time I want it, I can't find it, of course. I, I think if there's anything that has a survey of the different types, it's going to have uh, L-A-L-R in it somewhere. This is actually one of my favorite. Um, I'm going to bring this up on the stream here. Yes. OK. This is one of my favorite. Lost most of our audience. <laughs> Hello, audience. Stick with us. It's going to be fun. It's we're gonna, gonna be it's fun. code in a minute, okay? Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Here's uh, here's something for you. Uh, share. Let's see if this comes through. There we go. Oh, make it a bit bigger. So this is a chapter from actually from one of the books I have here, and I can give you the it's essence of compilers. I can give you the author and uh, link to it in a minute. But here you go. Um, it's important to realize that the lexical analyzer is only concerned with recognizing language symbols in, in order to pass them on to the syntax analyzer. So these are the two steps that we, we did briefly touch on this last week. So we're talking about lexical analysis, what we're talking about now, which is like how you take the text and make it into something that can be understood. We don't care necessarily what order they come in at, at, at the very beginning. Then that is, this, that is the syntax uh, analyzer's job or syntax analysis. Um, right. It would not detect an error, for example, with the foreign symbols, right? Because that's valid. This is like talking about C or something. This is like valid, completely valid. Each of the symbols is perfectly correct in itself, and it'd be up, it'd be up to the syntax analyzer to realize that it did not form the style or even part of any program, nor would the lexical analyzer be able to understand any scope of variables and such and such, right? Yeah. And here's an example here. So we could say a letter followed by a letter or a digit is. Um, yeah, for let's go now, this is convenient if this is an identifier, what we're just talking about, right? So this is like any program language. And a real number or flight point number would be plus or minus followed by a di digit, any number of which, followed by a period, followed by a digit, and followed by, uh, or a digit and followed by any number of digits, right? Now notice we've jumped from BNF format to regex format, which is yeah. another valid way of representing what a valid string is. We won't we won't go there too much, but because uh, uh, <laughs> regex has many forms and many problems, and we won't go there. Yes. But but here is an example of that implemented in code, right? I know this is not this is C, so this is not like uh, representative Dart, but we could easily do this in Dart. And that is reading a character. Is it alphanumeric? Then reading another character. Otherwise, there's an error. After you've read the first character in, which is this one here. Then is an app is reading the character, is it alphanumeric or is it a digit? And keep reading in. We've just described that that one there and also the BNF form that we that was very similar to what we saw earlier, right? Yeah. And this goes yeah, on. Yeah. Here, here's the what here's the here's the here's the logic for doing a a float point number. You're reading the character, yep. is it a plus or minus? You read another character, is it a digit? You read another character until there's no more digits. Is the next character a dot? Reading that digit. Otherwise, there's an error because it's not syntactically correct for our syntax and so on and so forth. So this is really what it boils down to. And this is explained in the book. And it's also explained in set theory and a bunch of other things. And, and you know, you're seeing that the state machine drawn up. And I don't know there's, there's you can also do it with a state machine, which is very similar to what we just saw. And uh, so on and so forth. And, and there's a lot of material around this. And we don't want to bore you with all of this stuff. We want to get into something interesting. So we're going to get to some code. Like we like code. Uh, let's yeah, let's do live coding. Let's see how many typos you can make. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we were just talking about the stream. I've got a new keyboard, so this is going to be fun. Um, yep. Uh, yeah. Make sure you get your questions in the chat. We will get to your questions. We'll we'll we'll, we'll be doing that throughout the yes. stream. We'll I'm, I'm still watching out, the so. chat for Q colon. I haven't seen Q colon recently, including the question that just popped in. So if they so, want that for us, Q colon. So today, 
we're going to be we're going to make a little interpreter and then if we have time make it a compiler or vice versa i know we can we to us it's making a compiler making it compile is not as difficult as you might first think but we need to explain the concepts as we go so um take that as you will so i'm um, just getting some reference up here so we can share this i've completely lost my reference uh i have lost it i've i've completely lost what i was trying to... oh no no there is so so we were talking about um this um uh stuff that we we're talking about last week which was um what was it called it was called um bf <laughs> yeah in nice in nice way um and uh so i'm trying to find my references um where are we sorry so um there's a lovely page on this i'll bring this up on i'll share the screen here so share the screen here we go this should work there we go all right so um So this is what's called an esoteric programming language. In other words, it it it's a toy programming language, okay? Um, and this is the, the page you want to go to. Um, so um, it's been called um, it it's 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 been it's just funny, right? So end of the day is it is we were talking about so so we were talking about this uh, briefly before me me and Randall, but um, BF, and I'm going to refer to it as BF, but just to be polite. But BF is um, is a Turing complete programming language. Um, so you want to go look up what uh, uh, Alan Turing came up with is his his um, uh, what's the word uh, his uh, his papers around around this. But but a pro a programming language needs to be Turing complete. And uh, there you go, um, based on the Turing machine, which is what we're just talking about. Um, Anyway, and um, essentially the language design, the entire language is written in these characters that you see on screen. <laughs> and this is the entire thing. So you can go forward, you can go backwards. So the idea is you have a bunch of cells or memory, right? And when you put an arrow one way or the other, you're, you're pointing to a different index in that memory. And then the plus or minus increments that memory address by what's in that, the value in that memory address by one or, or minus one. And then a dot outputs uh, the byte of that address, the value of that address, and a comma accepts an input in and overwrites that memory address. And then we just have looping. So uh, the open square bracket starts a loop and the closed square bracket ends a loop. Now specifically, it looks like when it, when you go to the uh, when you're at the end of the loop. If I remember right, you might be at the beginning. Uh, we'll have a look here in a minute. Um, when when the value of that cell that is currently where the data point points to is zero, then it exits the loop. So um, that's literally the entire language. Now you won't believe this, but you can do a lot with this. And I'm going to show you something. So we're gonna we should in theory get to run this in. Um, in our own, I'll share my screen here. Um, and then uh, I'll also push up a repo and you can all check it out and play along if you want to. So um, let's see now, uh, what should I do first? Let me, uh, Randall, do you wanna, um, do you wanna, uh, here, I'm gonna post this in the chat for everyone. And Randall, if you wanna share your screen and you can have a look through some of these examples um you should see that link in the chat right now what what do you what do you want me to do so there's a website in the chat if you can uh, open up and share that oh that's okay. got that's got that's an online interpreter for bf oops 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 i didn't mean to do that um okay how do i click on that ah oh it's well, I, put, I, I can put it in the private chat no i got it, I got it. Uh, yeah, if you can just open it up and then share it, and I'll and I'll just do some prep work here and get things ready. Okay. All right, and 
Share is somehow would be in StreamYard, which is in here. Uh, oh, that opened in a totally wrong window. No wonder I'm confused. Oh, no, I guess I do want it there. Uh, it's the first time I've shared, I think. That's why I'm getting lost. Okay, share, share a um, share screen, but not screen. We want to share a Chrome tab, which is this one, and share. Okay, I think I got it. Do you see it? Yep. Okay, perfect. Bigger. Embiggen, come on, big. There we go. All right. And is what that, do you want me to do that, with this? Just keep slowly uh, scrolling. That, through it? That, no, I was gonna say uh, you can you should be able to like if, uh, check out some examples uh, at the top. Oh, there's the, 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 the second code. tab library. Oh, library. Okay. Yeah. And like go to hello world. And click Let's play see. next to the top hello world one. That should. You get loads. Okay. That's the Hello World. So this is Hello World with comments. And oh, if you right click, here. This stuff, you, yeah. yeah. And then underneath the box with all the code in, I think there's a play button. So you, yeah, press, the program. Run pro you press the run program, it should. Right. So this, this must all be like comments. Right? Yes. Anything. So to be clear, anything that's not one of the characters that it supports, it just ignores. Wow. And that's, okay. and then so, oh, that's why these are all comments. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's just weird. That's already yes. just weird. Okay, we'll run it. And look at and that. Again, you, oh, and the wow. world, it's amazing. So if, wow. if, you go, if you go back to the library, actually, okay. if you go back to the library, um, and there's... Uh, back one. It's there, third tab. Um, no, I mean third tab. Oh, library, inside. right, there we go. Oh, I right. see it switched my tabs. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then if you yeah. press the second one, hit play on the second one, Hello World Short, that shows you without comments. Oh, my God. And it's, that's so, it. That's so, but that's it. Line. But that's it, right? Like, like you could break, oh, you can I hit see. enter. Scrolls. You can hit enter and it break into multiple up. lines because, again, new line yeah. is just ignored. So, like, right in the middle here, I could just hit. If you want turn. to, anywhere you like. There you go. There so we that's go. Hello. So you know, hey, that's how you, that's exactly how you halfway. How do I that's do how that? you print Hello World. So, you right press around, it should still work fine, hopefully. Yep. And it does. Yeah. So cool. what we what's happening here is it's it's we're calculating the the values of each of the ASCII values for each of the letters, and then we're at printing them out. But you could equally print yeah. like the bell character, and make a sound, mm -hmm. or print new lines and returns and all sorts of fun things. Have a look around the library for five minutes, and I'll, and I'll just quickly uh, um, get this repo up for everyone. Okay, let, let me look for something more complex. Library. Um, golden Probably ratio one. to in golden ratio to infinite precision never terminates. Ooh. Yeah, you probably want to make sure you hit stop after. <laughs> okay. We'll find out <laughs> Maybe not then. Maybe not. Oh, no, then. you can try it. I mean, you know, it might it might work. Oh, selfie prints its own code. So this is called a uh what do they call that? Where it prints its own code. Prints its own code. Uh, I have no idea. I don't remember. It's some name for that. Oh, and you can't really see anything. It's just a bunch of text. Um, let's see if I scroll left and right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is pretty big. Look at that. Oh, boy, this is big. Somebody put some work into this. That's just crazy. I'll run it. I'm just just going to show exactly the same thing as what it is. Yep, there it is. If I scroll this all the way to the left, we should see this match up. Um. Oh, it even prints the author's. Oh, that's the author in there. No, it's line one. This is a comment. The code, right? It's a comment, yeah. right? So greater, greater, plus, 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 greater. Yeah, this <laughs> just takes this takes a, a lot of work. Yeah, uh, actually, we talked about this last week when we said this program generates itself in a loop. We talked yeah. about the Ouroboros or whatever it was. Ouroboros, yeah. There's a name for that. Yeah. I can't remember what it was. We'll go to last week's yeah. video and you can find it. Yeah, exactly. That's my point to that. We have a large library of past shows, so you should definitely check them out. Watch them all beginning to end, and then you can feel okay just laying down quietly for a long time. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and uh, it's quite a library. Let's see if there's anything else. It's cool. It's like 99 bottles. Yes. Let's do 99 bottles. Um, so let's see. This is. Wait. Is this. Is, is this. NCC interpreter is available on the internet. Oh, for BF. Okay, that's what we're trying to say. Uh, but anyway, this is 99 bottles. Look at that. So if I run this, I should see. Yep. Look at that. And it's actually pausing between them, I think. Yeah, that's just taking a while to run. That's cool. Now, there's some good television. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope you realize... Positive. I hope you realize we're bringing this to you with great expense <laughs> and with careful what's that, selection. What's that line from Jurassic Park? Spend no expense. <laughs> mm -hmm. We've already paid all the expenses that we've related to with this. Um, oh, we've got more questions coming up in the... Uh, Keep the questions coming. We'll get them. Yep, I'm marking them all. I'm seeing them all. Thank you, VJ. Thank you, Nas. I can just add the remote, and then we can start doing some magic, I guess. Okay, tab, there it is. Okay. Down to 26. Right. Now. It's going and going and going, does it? <laughs> yeah, well, it goes to zero. Well, let's see if it All stops. Right. Let's see if it goes to negative one. <laughs> see how much of a well, failure it might be. Hey, let's see if there's a failure mode at the end. Two, one, bing! It does finish. Look at that. At That's zero. great. Is it finished? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Okay. Uh, any other machine no, edits or we're, we're done? Let's uh, share my screen now. Okay, um, so I'm done. I'll close. Share screen. Let's see. Okay. See if they're going to get some straight. So um, we're going to try a few things here. I'm not sure. We'll see how far we get. Um, okay. So um, I wanted to show off something here. So in the way back machine, um, you'll have to find this guy's website because I'm afraid uh, I found him. I found him on, I found him on LinkedIn. Um, he's a programmer. He apparently works at, his name's John Ripley, he works at Tribal Group now apparently, but um, he's the guy that actually came up with um, this program written in, in BF. And um, I will put the link to the, his website's no longer operational, which is a shame. Um, but this is the website and it's a text adventure game an entire text adventure game written in in bf and um this then i will run it here Lark's the kingdom and this is a pre-compiled one I've done, i made here's one i made earlier um but yeah so there you go look this is actually it do you want long descriptions yes there you go it's a text adventure game i want to uh, let's get help i can't remember the command uh pick take we can take so we could say uh look Take two. You have taken number two. So now I can look at my inventory. I can decide. There you go. I can go east. I know south. South. Oh, look, there's a dynamite. Stick a dynamite. Because I'm like, okay, we'll take the dynamite. I don't know. You know, it's a text adventure game. Anyway, which is quite, you know, uh, uh, quite amazing as it goes, right? So in, in, we're going to, we're going to look at this um, in in B in BF. This is uh, let's see what it looks like. Um, so um, we have this is it's two megabytes of BF code, and this is it. This is the entire thing. It's ridiculous. Now I, I'm pretty sure he did not code this by hand because that would be insane. But yeah. um, it, it's it's interesting that you know a program. And can be represented by these characters, right? A full program, right? Yep. Um, and there's, there's no, I mean, the ASCII is, is, is the ASCII, like there's no text strings here because the text that's output is in representation of these characters, right? So like 10, so, so let's, um, 
let's let's we could we could try writing let's we're going to write our interpreter first and we'll have our interpreter interpret hello world and verify that, that use it as our verification case that this works so we have our uh basic hello world here and we have it with comments so we could verify that it works with and without comments so let's uh rename this and uh, we'll leave it as that it doesn't matter um and then what we're going to do is um yeah so i actually so i actually wrote a compiler before and this is a compiler in go it's not too it's not too big um and it outputs this assembler this this is what it compiled to this is the machine code of as you were of of that of that text adventure game and that's what i compiled and what you saw working so that's kind of fun <laughs> and we'll hopefully get there eventually but let's um let's, let's start with something simple so obviously this is just going to print hello world which is um obviously not the hello world from this is hello world from dart as it were so oh i think we've got majid who's joined us i see a majid in the background majid do you want to ah. come on stream we'll get a thumbs up there you go thumbs up there you go hello mate Hi. how's it going hey. Welcome. Very Whoa. good. Are, Very are you having are you having fun? Yeah, I do. I'm actually this is way out of my scope to be honest. But I'm well, really enjoying what you're doing. Is this is this big <laughs> enough for everyone? No, do I is it is I'm yeah, trying yeah, to, yeah. Uh, it's, no. uh, maybe a little bit bigger. Is maybe that, one. Is that, one bigger. One and bigger. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah that'll right. work. So let's just see how the output is. Perfect. Uh, yeah. There you go. Hopefully that's uh, big enough. We don't actually need much of that at the moment. Right. So what we first want to do is uh, we're going to uh, – so so if we look at the, the – um, if we look at the, the actual design of the language, uh, it simply is a state machine model of 30,000 byte cells. 30,000 I think was arbitrary. I mean, you could obviously have smaller and bigger, but – all soft, if you if the software was written to go out of range, it would just crash or error in some fashion. So um, we, we'll allocate that much memory. Um, so this is this is how we're going to do this. So we could do um, first of all, let's have it so that we can specify a file. Let's use this mini one on the command line. So we do that by adding a program argument, and here we can say sample. sample. So this is um, oh, I'll, I'll I'll put this in the chat. This is the uh, repo. So that should mean that this will come through in the arguments. So let's see if that comes through in the arguments. So print arguments. And let's Simon, see if let's have the entire thing full of screen and put us like below the screen. I think. It's better because we see more. something yeah, like that. Better. Yeah, that better. Let's get rid of Maybe the. You should, yeah, get rid of the hash overlay. There we and go. I, I can. I mean, I can. Yeah, it's much better right now. Don't, don't right now. Needs to be wider, but but but, is that better for everyone? Is anyone? If you got any problems, speak up in the chat. Otherwise, yeah, we won't know. Anyway. So okay, so we got the argument come through. It's an array of one string. That's great. Um, so what we should be able to do now is say uh, final file equals file arguments at zero. In bio. And then we want to read that files uh, entire, entirety into memory. I mean, we, in olden world, you might want to read byte by byte, but right now we're you know we're, we've got plenty of RAM to go around. So read uh, read a string, right? We're just going to interpret the entire thing as a string. Um, so we can actually, since we don't care about the file anymore, we can make that one line. Oops. And then um, uh, program the program, uh, and then we can say if arguments. Um, is equal to zero so you haven't passed any arguments we should probably put something like usage i only remember the platform script or something script i think that's it um you say less than one uh yeah. because well yeah i'll guess if zero is fine but you don't want it if it's two either do you hmm 
Um, and, okay. Sorry, philosophy. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, if it's empty. I'm just saying that the idea here being that, you know, if, if we don't have any arguments, if someone tries to run the program without any arguments, it will give this error, right? So if I hit play, this will this will be fine. And then if I take away this argument and hit, hit run, we get, oh, you tried to run it without the file name. You should use it with the file name. So now the point here is uh, we didn't get an error when we loaded the program. So let's assume that we have it and say print program. Instance of future of string. Uh oh, I failed. Right, so we need to do a wait. We could do it synchronous. We do it synchronous. We don't need to wait. There we go. There's our there's our EF code, as it were. And then what we want to do is in uh, we, what well, we need to allocate that thirty thousand block of memory. So we'll say final uh, cells equals. Well, each one's an integer, and we actually want to actually say list dot filled. It will start with zero, so thirty thousand, three hundred thousand. Yeah, filled with zero. Yes, wait, it's right. Yeah, fill value. Yeah, global false. I think that's the default actually. There's our cells. Now we want to run the program. Well, this should be quite straightforward. So what we want to say is um, we want to go through character by character, right? Um, yeah, I suppose we need, a, we need a pointer where we are in the memory. So we'll say pointer. I guess it starts off at zero. And then, um, so I'm just thinking, I'm going to look at it. Yeah, I guess let's 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 just say if let's just do a, a try to think if we should be going through this byte by byte. By. I guess so. So we say f you can enter loops though, can't you? So is there an hang on a minute. Is there an end state to this? Hang on, I'm, I maybe I'm thinking about this wrong. Because uh, it's Turing complete, right? So, mm -mm -mm. okay, here we go. Uh, the commands are executed sequentially with some exceptions. An instruction pointer begins at the first command, and each command it points to is executed. After which, so we have an instruction pointer, um, after which it normally moves forward to the next command. The program terminates when the instruction pointer moves past the last command. Okay, well, there's our thing. So we've got, we have that pointer for where we are in the memory. We also have a program, what's called a program counter or instruction pointer. We'll call it IP, instruction pointer. So what we're saying is whilst instruction pointer is greater than or equal to zero and Instruction pointer is less than to, uh, less than our cell's length, right? And if for some reason it comes out of that, then we've ended. So we'll say program terminated. Right? Then when we're in the loop, we'll say when we get the current, I guess the current command, the um, program. Okay, so we're talking about this, like the values of these cells. I suppose we're trying to look up. I think what we're probably better off is to get code units. So now that's this this program is a list of integers, and then we can just oh, yeah the value from where we are in the list, and then what we want to do is get that command and see if it's a certain value, right? So if the, and this is the command that we were just talking about earlier, right? So there's only a few. But we could look at strings, in fact. But there's actually a, a package uh, on dev for this. So let's add that. Um, by the way, this, this repo I'm working on right now can be found on GitHub now. And I'll post that link in the chat. Uh, hopefully, everyone gets that. Um, 
I'll push this in a second and you'll get my most up to date if you want to have a foot around along with us. Um, right, so dependencies. Uh, we don't need the part dependency. Uh, I'll leave it in there. Uh, what was the same? Mm, yeah, char code. I don't get the. Oh, I do. <laughs> so why don't I get the suggestions? Right. So char code is an interesting package. The so char code, what it does is, well, I'll show you in here. We can import it. So in most other languages, you have uh, what's called um, literal in, literal uh, characters, and these are the character like essentially like the the ASCII character values. I won't go into the details here, but this is what they are. So this is the this is the decimal value, and each one's been given a name in the char code library. So these are control sequences at the very beginning. But when you start getting down, there's your equal symbol on your keyboard. It's 3D in hex, and you can just do dollar sign equals dollar sign greater than. So whenever you want to like check one of these things, we can use it. And this is what we want to do. So we have these symbols over here on the left. So we want greater than. And when we receive a greater than, we want to increase our instruction pointer. Right. Um, oh, it's final. No, final. So that's my fault. Uh, oops. Um, and then when we get less than, right? This is this is literally what it says here. Increment the pointer to point to the next cell. Decrement increments the value uh, by one at the data pointer address so the next one is case plus now we're doing here is saying cells etr plus plus break uh, minus cells And then we have a, a, I guess you call it period. What is it? What do you call that? Um, that was period. Where's well, full stop? Ah, English, English people made this. <laughs> um, right, and full stop. Right, so full stop here says output one character. Okay, so we want to output character. Now, if we do print, the problem with doing the print statement is it adds a new line at the end of everything for you. And we don't want to do that. We want to just output one character. So we do that with with the standard standard ways of doing that in software. And one of them is standard out. Standard out is how you access the output of a, of a terminal. And we can just write a character to that, write char code. And then we have standard in, and we can read from standard in. So read by. And these are the back, these are the two functions we're going to use. So standard out right is what we want to do for so full stops is output character. So that's what we're going to do. And then this is going to be a character at the current cell. And then the comma is standard in, and that would be cells PTR equals standard in dot read byte, I guess. Okay. That's the sort of the main stuff here. What we don't have is loops yet. So we're going to have to figure that one out. And, they, and also you have nested loops. So that's another thing we need to think about. And we're going to get there. So let's get rid of those. Um, so the hello world, what does, do we have like, we have an echo here. This has loops. Uh, what the, I think we're going to have loops in all these. It's pretty hard to do this anyway with the characters that we have. So we're going to have to implement loops. So let's let's get to that point now, I guess. We're getting there. How's the question coming in? Nothing immediately about this, about a lot of other things. Oh, see, come on. <laughs> so, no, have, so have, have, we, have we lost everyone? This. No, if anyone finds this, I, if you're not finding this interesting, then uh, feel free to talk about what we're doing here. Do you follow what we're doing? Like, um, I, I, I'm actually enjoying it. I, I, I think it's really amazing to me how you can just simply look at the spec and go, well, that means when I see this, do this. 
And so all you had to think about was what are the data structures that will support the things that it, that the BF spec says you got to have. And then you got to figure out how to translate the input characters into their corresponding actions. So this, this is now where it gets tough. So now we're going to imp implement logic. So Oh, this question... was the easy part. Oh, no wonder. Okay. It looked easy now. It's like, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> so so I did, we did post this. We did post this link on the chat, but this, this is actually where it gets, okay, I guess, fun now. So if the byte pointer, the data pointer, uh, and the data pointer is zero, then instead of moving the instruction pointer to the following command, jump forward to the command after the matching this end bracket. So how do we find matching brackets? That's the question. Oh, Callan's uh, comment is this is genuinely fascinating plus dart syntax goodies. So yeah, we're, we're still, we still got them. We still got people. That are yeah, good. As long as we so. still got people interested. Um, yeah, that's good. <laughs> if, if the, if the byte at the data pointer uh, is non-zero, this is the end one, sorry, the end part. It, then instead of moving to the instruction pointed forward to the next command, jump it back to the command. See, I thought there was only one condition at the end. I didn't think there was one at the beginning. And in fact, that's how I programmed my compiler. It worked fine. So um, I I might have have misread the spec previously. Let's have a look. What did I have to do on the previous one? Um, where's my, it's in my template here. So I, I know this is going out. I just want to kind of check. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I, it's only my opening bracket that I did the comparison on, and then jump to the end. So, all right. So, well, we're gonna we're gonna probably have to fix that now, I guess. Ah, oh, alternatively, the close command may instead be translated to an unconditional jump to the corresponding start, and vice versa. Aha! A program would be save the same, uh, but run more slowly due to unnecessary double searching. Uh, if you search at all, that's the question. So when we, this is actually, this actually works, right? So when we get to the closing bracket, we want to jump to the last place that's, that was open from an open bracket, right? Because you're always going to need a, you're going to need like a stack then. As yeah, you that's why open I'm thinking brackets, that. You're going to push stuff on a stack. And then as you see uh, pops, you got to pop and then figure out what the so we'll item have like stack a was. stack and we'll call it what well, uh, I mean, it could just be an integer stack, right? It's been integer array. And we yep. could say, can we do like we can do, but like, can you pop on an integer array? You can't really, can you? It's not sure. really designed for that, sure. right? Oh, wait, no, why can't you do is it? There's, a, there's another form though, Q, isn't there? Uh, yeah, that's uh, Q. Q is a construction Q, I know there is. This, I can't remember what it's called now. All right, dark collection Q. And then you can do hop, I think, on a Q. You could do remove add and, and insert to do the same this, thing with yeah. a list, but Q is gonna, designed for this. Yeah, I'll oh, add first, is, hop, yeah. remove last, all that kind of stuff. There you go, perfect. So, so we want to, can you peek? Why, why am I not getting any like, my an analysis server is just not liking me at the moment. Restart on it. It's what I do a lot. There's add first. So last. Okay, so you can look at the last value. Q has remove last. Yeah, and, and it has add last and remove last. Now because I want because I want to check it, but I think that's what we want. So Let's say we've got a stack. So what we want to say is when we reach an open bracket. Thanks, Elijah. What, what have we got? Do we have let's remove last? Oh yeah, his his mention of thanks. Um so what it's saying here, may so if the end command is an unconditional jump to the corresponding start, then what we can do is just say IP equals stack dot remove last. Or do we? Let me have a think here. Yeah, sorry, I'm not. So, so each time we come across a open bracket, we add it, and each time we come a close bracket, we pop it. Makes sense. So here we want to always do stack dot add last ip right where we currently are. Yeah. 
Now, IP needs to increment only after we complete the case. So, so I'm just thinking about how do we increment our program pointer here? Because if I increment it beforehand, then this is going to be off by one. But then this will be off. By, one of these is going to be off by one. So let's just do plus plus here. So what this is doing, by the way, everyone. So this is basically saying increment IP after it's been evaluated. If I put it this side, it means increment and then evaluate the result. So this would this would look at pro, the indexing program of one plus IP together, and then they'll look at it. This is saying look at get IP into program and then add one to IP. So this is the same as just doing IP on the next line like this. I'll leave it like this for simplicity, but but the shortcut is just to add plus plus in next to the value. Anyway, so so my thought here is that this is just minus one. So we go to where the bracket is, and we only add it if we enter the loop. So here we can say if hang a minute, hang a minute. Yeah, it, yeah, we want to say if the value was it so we say uh value at value at cells ptr so here it says if the data pointer is if the bytes of the data pointer is zero then instead of moving to the instruction pointer forward to the next command jump it forward to the command after the matching close bracket now we want to search for the matching close bracket Oh, shit. Is that going to work? Because, yeah, the, this isn't going to work. What am I thinking? This. Let's see if I can find what I did before. Save myself a few minutes. So I did a, I did actually this in assembler macros to kind of help with this before. But um, it, this, this yeah, would be a great when, interview question. Yeah, actually oh, yeah. a horrible, a horrible interview question. Horrible. I say. <laughs> Please don't so, use this. Please. I was I was pushing, but I already had the label for end pre pre apply because during compilation. So the question here is, do we need to search for the end bracket, right? Because if we search for the closing bracket, we might have multiple closing brackets in, inside, right? So what I'm saying is, for example, let's say we go to this one and we go to this one and then this, so here's an example here, right? So I made this picture for everyone to see, see what the problem is that we're talking about. So we go plus, 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 we get to the open bracket, right? We then do this stuff. And we get to another open bracket and we do some more stuff and then that closes that one and that closes uh, that carries on we have another opening bracket which runs some code in it another closing bracket and finally we close it here and run this code right so the problem is that big enough for everyone uh, the problem here is we, we when we evaluate this we pop the address of this one off the stack and return back to it right if this checks for non-zero which is what we want to do it then has to go to this address here now this is a good simple clean example how do we do that on the outside so on the outside we go to this address it pop goes jumps back to this address of where this is in memory and then we want to go forward we need to find a matching we need to find the matching thing. So we need to each time we, we need to loop over, and each time we have an entering one, we have a leading one until we get back to zero. And that's it. So basically, we need to do some counting. And this is what the sluggish thing is in interpreting this. We're currently doing interpreting, right? So we need to find out what the address is of the closing bracket. So we're saying closing. You could you could while you're doing the IP. compile pass. While you're doing the compile pass, you push, you push uh, a note that says that for this open bracket, I am at this location in my stack processing, 
And when you see the closed bracket, you go back and patch up the open bracket so it knows where the closed bracket is. Yeah, and that's exactly what we would do during Compilot. There's, there's a bunch of ways to do this, but, you know, we're doing interpreting okay. here. So, okay. Um, oh, okay. All right. We'll do yeah, it the hard list, way. All right. Uh, let's say list of in and say program. We have to have a psychic part of the program is what we're saying. So, and we want uh, the current IP, the program and IP, and we want to find that closing bracket. So what we'll say is, first of all, say if value is is not equal to zero, then we want to add to the stack. That's it. Add so we can carry on. Otherwise, we're going to want to set IP to the closing bracket, find closing bracket from this program, current IP plus one. Um, that's what that's what the, the software calls us to do, right? Now we need to know how to find a closing bracket. So given the example that we just had, I'm going to put these side by side just so that they're easier to see. Hopefully this is, I'll get this bigger. So the solution that we need to find here is uh, given uh, we need like a uh, ref, a ref equals zero. So we 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 need to be one when we when we look at the current IP, it's going to be on opening bracket, right? And it's not until we get to the closing bracket that we want to increment. So I'm going to this plus one. Basically, what, when we, we're going to loop over the program, so we'll say uh, while, yes, we're going to say IP. So we're going to do the same same condition up here. And if we get to the end, if we get to the end of the program before we reach it, then the problem the problem here here is that um, the program. This is, this is reading the data. This is, uh, but if we reach the end of the program itself, then then we've gone too far and it's it's all terrible, right? So we say if IP greater right than or equal to program dot length, then uh, we want to throw matching brace bracket not found. Very obtuse error, but you know it is what it is. Um, right. So then, each time we each time we go across the program, we want to say uh, instruction equals program IP. If the instruction is equal to opening bracket bracket, then we increment our reference. Else, if instruction closing bracket. And we get rid of our, uh, we dec decrement our reference. And then each, each time we go around this loop, we want to increase IP. Then we exit the loop. If actually we're going to do a do while, sorry, because this is on the, the wrong side of this. So do while. Um, and we want to check to see if um, ref is equal to zero. The ref is equal to zero at this point, it means that we've got back to the matching embrace. Does that kind of make sense to anyone? <laughs> so this is basically like it's, it's cheap reference counting. So we so we're here. So this is where this line two here. And we're, we're we're before this bracket when we enter IP points to this instruction. It, we enter here, and the instruction that we're reading is this open bracket. So we get open bracket. So we increment by one. We then get to the end of the loop. We increment our instruction pointer to this to this next character, and ref. Uh, and ref is not not zero, and it's still less than IP. So we continue around the loop, and we'll keep instructing going past all these instructions because they don't match either of the brackets. And when we reach for another bracket, we increment by one. So now ref is going to be two. And we we do all these, and we get to this one. Now we negate one. So now it's one. We keep going around the loop. This is this becomes two back to one. And when we read this one here, which is the one we want to end on, it's going to decrement by one, and it's going to be zero. And at that point, we want to exit the uh, uh, exit the function and return the current IP, which would be the place which is at the end of the loop. Does that make sense to everyone? I say ship it. No, 
Well, your theory goes, <laughs> you say that, the theory goes, this should work. Should we hit play and find out? Let's hit play and yeah. find out. Yeah. Do we? See where it blows up. Let's hit play. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Bracket uh, found. Fail. Oh, we failed. So what did I do wrong? Let's find out. So we need some debugging here because this is this is not helpful. So what we don't have is... Um, so we, we actually we do something quite naughty here is that we're modifying the parameter being passed in, which is never a good thing. So we want to make a, a, another variable to have our incrementing instruction pointer. So we call this uh, dip with delta instruction pointer, uh, or, or reference instruction, or bracket instruction pointer. I don't know. This is a really, really bad name, but I don't care. Right. Um, dip. Dip. Okay, so that's the, the reason we're doing this is now we can say imagine not bracket not found for IP. Now what we can do is stick a uh, so we know where and we know what we're reading, which is this one over here. We don't know the line, or so we don't. We want to know the line and the column that we're on, so we know where. So the instruction point is fine, but for debugging purposes, we don't know where that is. So if I hit run, we're just going to get back a number, right? Or oh, it breaks, it loops forever. <laughs> what, did I, what did I change? Let's have a look. Bip. This is good. I mean, like, we're getting somewhere. Bip, 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 bip. That. That shouldn't make any difference. Am I, am I missing something here? If ref is equal to zero. Oh, does whilst ref does not equal zero. Okay, good. Did I change that or is that? Because as soon as it equals zero, we want to exit. And this. Or this. So if, you know, or because if it goes above that, we want to exit. Line 59, you forgot to change IP to DIP. 59? Yep. Oh, look at that. Yeah. That makes a difference. Thank you, Charles. we got people watching this in the chat, Good. so it's Good. obviously this, working. This is great. So this, is, this is what we call pair programming. <laughs> right. um, Non-inclusive range. Okay, that's good um so we went out of range which is interesting because i thought out is equal to oh, i'm missing here program it's more like more like gang program i might have entered it might have entered i wonder if it entered with an ip that's out of range. Okay, so what we could do, um, do we want to try catch this and throw match and bracket not found? We could probably add some more debugging and add some position analysis. Let's see if, so we're assuming there's 130 characters, I can save that file there and hit play. Okay, and we've got 120, which would be the last place in the file here. Let's, um, Let's break this down a little bit. Uh, dollar, the, sorry, Elijah just said in chat, what does the dollar sign operator do? It doesn't. It's, it's just a packed character that's used inside variable names. You can just use this part of your variable naming. It's a valid starting character. It's a valid character for variable names, uh, for identifiers. So. Um, it's, it's, it's used, in this case, the char code library uses it to identify its things uniquely, which is kind of a nice like special speciality, but just by convention. Yeah, so something's not right here. Um, so that's the entire program on the right that we're trying to run. So uh, if I hit save, we should get a couple more characters. Yeah, good. So what we could do is let's do a little bit of debugging here and say found, uh, found this. Sign bit at bit. Just see what see if see if our our 
I don't know if it's remotely right. Okay, found a closing bracket. Did I get these mixed up? Opening bracket, closing bracket. Fold. See, I need to know what I need to know line and column. So we 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 can we can we can take our uh, IP and make a new position class or something that that contains column and row. And each time we read an input, that's um, a new line. We can reset the column counter, something like that. Um, it's very strange though, right? So. I could go look at the byte offset. I don't think we get anything like that in here. Kind of annoying. Um, I don't get why it's doing that. We're, we're completely missing. We should be seeing an open bracket as the very first thing. Uh, so let's, let's do some debugging here because obviously something is not right. So plus, 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 plus. Changed our PTR. An IP. Do what we could do. I guess we could print off each command in sequence and see where we got to, right? Let me call it command. Um, print it off and see what we get. Okay, hey, that's not helpful. We need it as a string. Okay. So so this is interesting, right? So plus 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 plus. Then we've got our new line, then we have our open brace, then we have our ah IPs incremented. Ah, that's the problem. So IP is incremented before we get to this line here. So I do the minus one here. Ah, we'll fix it there. So basically, yeah, there we go. Open, close, open, close, open, close. So the question here is also, why don't we see anything? So let's run. Wow, wow, wow. So something else went wrong. Is that our stack, do we think? So find closing bracket. Do we want to do the whole idea of doing this not equal to zero? So if it's equal to zero, it goes and jumps to the end. And we can pop, let's say found closing at my page. Really? Really? I was not expecting that result. So that's IP minus one, which would be the opening bracket, right? Because it's incremented, sure. And when we get to the last, we reset it back to that, which means the next time around the loop, it's going to read an open bracket and do the conditions. That's, that's correct. I was expecting to see at least some of these. So when it did need to match, it never exited. So our function is still wrong. So we got to 19, which is this one. We got to the end bracket. Something's not adding up here, right? Because these should print something off then. Because if it's, it's entering this function multiple times, what what have we what have we messed up here? Are you resetting IP after we found it? Yeah, um, we we take the returning result of this function and set that to IP. And then the next, then it exits the, the loop, the, the switch down, which loops around and then we'll read the instruction again. So that, that should be fine. 
Um, but I'm just, it's just a bit weird that we've. Maybe this is the case that it's not in range. How is it not in range though? So we're trying to access 132. BIP is incremented. And then we make the comparison. Or so this is this thing is or isn't it? it should be and so it's it's both. There we go. Oh, it works. How about that? All right, let's get rid of our debug statements. Right. Ship it. Uh, ship it. Ship it. It works. Ship it. Yeah. Test in production. Right. Run. Uh, it's okay. line 69. So, so it, should it be... prints Hello World, but we do have an error still. So how did that uh, get out? Is line 69 uh, go in the uh, chat room it's questioning it. <clears throat> should it be... Uh, no, because we be want to, we only want to throw the exception if 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 we're out of range. But the point yeah. here is, is this erring on this line here, right? I'm, I'm hang on, let me just make sure I'm I'm correct here. Code unit app, code units. Well, that's interesting. So this is kind of annoying. Oh, he says it's now sixty-seven. Is where the question is. Yeah. No. 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 It should oh, be wow, less than. less than, yeah, that's that's correct. Well, I mean, does less than or equal to shouldn't make a difference, and yeah, 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 no, I don't think so. No, I'm I'm kind of curious that why we're seeing this receive pull string patcher. So I think what's happening here is when we index here on this line, it's doing code unit app because the code units list that we get back uh, when I looked at the program here. So this is reading a string and we get the code units. What we actually need to do is create a new list from this. At the moment, it's using it, it's probably iterable. That's um, fingers. Where was I? So I'm just making a new list from the program. I'm going to see what the error is then. Yeah, okay. So that's global array. Line 18. Okay, so the ah, got it. I IP and cells. It's nothing to do with this. So this should be programmed. That's the problem. Mm. There we go. So as long as it's less than, that should terminate correctly. Very perfect. Uh, okay, so let's put this back to where we were. We don't need to create a new list. <coughs> yeah. So that there is. A working program hit play okay. and we're going to get rid of that program terminator it was just there just to verify that it actually shows so now there you go hello, sorry so i know it's pretty small there's hello world being printed yeah from this over here so um and i can hit another plus and we'll see what happens apparently oh, you hit another plus oh, and, you get, and you get garbage yep. out it's amazing um so what's happening here is this is this is essentially preparing the cells uh, with certain values in a loop. And then over here, we, we're going to those cells, negating and adding to those cells as we go. So we're going to we're gonna try our own little brain, uh, BF um, in code. But first of all, let's see if we can do some input. So we have this echo. And this is supposed to read in. These are all, by the way, from the site we posted earlier, which is this uh, interpret site. I'll post it again in the chat. So echo here gets a string from the input and shows it again by press, uh, after pressing Enter. So this is like reading a line. So we actually read character by character, but let's see what happens. I, I don't know. Let's, let's try it. So let's duplicate what we have here. And this one's going to be hello world. Okay. Um, and this one is going to be echo. What I'm going to do now, before I do any further, I'm going to uh, we're going to we're going to push this to the repo. So get status at all. First revision. Uh, my interpreter. Yeah, interpreter. 
Ok. Ah. Et non, on est là. Uh, I don't want to submit uh, again. I don't say that. Uh, yeah, uh, So that should be up on GitHub. There you go. So um, put that in the chat, and you guys can all grab it, play with it, do whatever you want to do with that. So we're going to try input now. Let's hit echo and hit run. So hey, look, it works. Hello. This is a Q, Q campaign. Yeah, lovely. So input works as well. That's nice. So yeah, okay. So now we have a full full BF interpreter. There you go. In a few hundred lines. So I mean, yeah, we're just following the guide of what the instructions mean. And essentially, this is a very simple simple example right so we've not done so this is direct from character to to execution right so from input to execution we don't have the two-step process we're talking about earlier which is lexical analysis and then syntax analysis so at the moment you have to this is this is what the different interpreter is like earlier when we were doing this if i put a matching and i'm matching brace in here and then try and run this right it's going to crash and i don't know do whatever it needs to do and 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 not work correctly right so here we should say if mac is empty throw unmatched using right uh much closing bracket got thrown right now if i put an open bracket here again right and now run this. There you go. Print off garbage, right? But I mean, like the the point here is, if I put loads of these, it's probably going to get. There you go. Unmatched bracket not found, right? The point here is, it got. I was hoping to to have like maybe a different output here. If I uh, let me just try something else. If I put it down here, okay. Apparently not there. Let's, My luck, I can't get to do what I wanted to do. Hang on. There we go. So, I hope you can see that. But basically, what's happened here is this part of the code up until that point printed H E L L O space W O, then it threw an exception saying unmatched closing bracket. Right. Now, that's interpret That's an example there of why interpreting a language is not as great as if you can compile it up front because what's happening now is i had to run my program get to the point in my program where the error occurred to then see it right this is you know this is not where you want to be right like you you can imagine that you write this big piece of software you make some changes and it's not until a user runs one feature that they realize oh that got broken right that's not where you want to be right and it's broken because syntactically it's not correct so having compile time, having a syntax and having a, a compile time, um, what's the word? Uh, um, the compile time benefits of having that assurance up front gives you some assurance as, as to things are working correctly. Um, anyway. um, so in theory, in theory, I have not tried this yet. Let's see if we can run the full adventure game. I mean, it works on the simple examples, input and output works. So shall we see? What do you, what do you think? Do you, want, do you want to put bets on it? Lost. Where are, where are we? I can't hear you. I'd say one in 10. One in 10. One in, oh, one, only one in 10. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yep. 
Well, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. There are more things that can go wrong than go right. I I trust you. Nine. (laughs) Nine. Oh, that's it. See, see, see. See, now that's it. You're going to lose your spot on the team here, Randall. Right. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Lost Kingdom. Let's hit play. Are you? You may want me because I'm not just a yes man. Nothing so far. Uh, That's a good sign. No, no news is good news. I, I mean, it's, it's it's two megabytes, so. That's not working, yeah. is it? Yeah. Ah! <laughs> I'm vindicated. I'm vindicated. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Is it just, I don't know, I think, is it just really, really slow? Because there's lots of loops to set things there up. Put it in a, put it in a, put some tracing in it. See what it lines oh, up. Joe, what, see, well, you won't be able to tell if it's an infinite loop though, right? Well, I really don't might. want to be, I mean, I could dump out the instructions as it runs them and just see if it's doing something. I have a feeling that, that there's a problem in our logic somewhere, but uh let's do ip uh let's do ip to radix uh pad left eight by uh uh yeah let's do a string So uh, this should, in theory, put off a bunch of crap. Okay, so this is interesting. So it stop. Okay, so this is actually a common thing to do. And that is this clears a memory cell. So this this increments the pointer, this uh, decrements the value and then in loops and when it gets to this one is you're checking the value of that at that address so if this becomes uh zero it should exit but we have a condition that is does not equal zero right which should mean that's correct uh ptr is not changing right so because that's the plus or minus change this value in the cell Greater than or equal, then change that. So the question is, what's happening here? So let's say open bracket. Let's see what value is as we go through. Shall we? Let's see. It might. Hey. Oh, negative. Negative. How do we get into negative a hundred thousand? Well, that's not. That shouldn't happen. So, uh, it's okay. So what we've got here is probably. See if I can. Did I miss it out of the log? It went so quick. Yes. All right. So let's let, let's tell this to terminate if value is less than zero. Right. Throw. At okay. So we got some actual stuff printed off. And at the very beginning, it got to minus one, which is interesting. I think that's because that there's an un- hit. So I think the original language does not have signing because they're bytes that are the treat as unsigned values. So if you decrement by one, I wonder if it doesn't go into negative. It doesn't. It just says byte cell. Ah, initials with zero. I don't think they can go into negative values. Hmm. So I think what we've got to do here is say, if, uh, the byte values, right? If this is less than two fifty, is less than 
54. Kevin Crane. Yeah, it's old PTR. It's greater than zero. Then we can say, right? That way you can never get into a negative number. I hey, took out our face. I, I took out our faces because it was blocking the console. Oh, sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Um, I can move the console over. Actually, can I move over here? Can I please move it somewhere? Uh, uh, did I lose the console? Apparently, I managed to lose my console. Make. Is that it? Oh. Uh, the world's come to an end. Right. Hit play. Are you still down there? Okay. Um, I mean, this is an important it. safety tip for all you out there. Learn your tools. <laughs> Why does it? <laughs> yeah. Right. Move to. Here we go. Move to. Right bottom. There we go. That's probably easier for everyone, right? Anyway, hit stop. That's that's going and going and going right now. So let's let's get rid of the hello world example. So the idea here is if I get rid of these printouts, which are just throwing things off, and this one especially, this is the point out. Hit play. Hey, it works. Look. Look at that. No way. Well, We're only like nine. five bugs away from getting it to work. That's not bad. Wow. Okay. I don't think it was supposed to print all this stuff off. <laughs> <laughs> so I think something definitely isn't right. So I think so we it's, need to... wor it's working for some really loose meaning for. I working. know. I think. I think <laughs> you can go into negative. I think maybe you can go into negative. I wonder if it wraps around because there may be bytes, right? So let's let we treat them as integers. There is like, there's there's a, there's a difference here in the way that they're expected to behave. Let's just try this here. So if I leave those conditions off, and this time say if it's if it's greater than zero, right? Then we loop. Otherwise, we do this. And then restart this and see what happens. Okay, so yes, well, that's even worse. So that didn't work. <laughs> right. So I can just so, see the alpha release release notes for this I product think, when you I ship think it. I think they're doing. I think he's <laughs> you'll get all the text at once. I think they. I think they're doing over. I think he's doing overflows. So I think the point here is if you try and increment past two fifty four at uh, two fifty five, should we say? It, it should set to the cell to zero. Right, to wrap it around. Um, if it's unsigned, that is. And then the same goes for here. This should be 254 or 255, right? So let's see what happens when we do that. Uh, no, that didn't work either. Okay. I'm I'm lost right now as to as to what might be causing a little problem. Do we have any hints? Get in there. Get in there. Get, in there. Get some debugging done. Who, who's turn? Sit there also. <laughs> right. Um, this is uh, this is interesting, right? Like, stop. I mean, can it be treating them as sign? 128. It doesn't suggest that in here anywhere. Let's see. Signed. Aha. Hang on. Aha. Here's generally this means avoiding incremental num. Okay. Is usually easy to write that things that do not have it cause integer wraparound or overflow. And therefore, don't depend on cell size. Generally, this means avoiding incremental past 255 or avoid overstepping the bounds, boundary of plus 128 minus 127 or signed 8-bit wraparound. Since there's no comparison operators, a program cannot distinguish between signed and unsigned to its complement. Um, and negative, uh, the negativeness of numbers is a matter of interpretation. This is what I was just talking about. So cell size, the classic cells are 8-bit in size. Cells are bytes, 
and this is still the most common size. However, non bring non textual data may need to distinguish the end of file. Thus, 16 bit cells can also be used. I wonder if this is using 16 bit cells then. So, there is a way of dealing with this. So, we do this list field, right? What we could actually do is to see what happens if we use like a you in a clamp list um, and just see what the behavior is. This will just clamp, right? And we can get rid of these checks. Okay. But that didn't work, but it didn't crash. So that's nice. Um, we could try uh, are you in 16 list and see what happens i have a feeling it's not gonna make a blinding difference oh it worked <laughs> <laughs> okay well there you go 16 bit cell size it is so maybe that's um maybe that's something for interpretation that we could actually add here right so what we could do is in our arguments Great. we could say What's that package that we have in, in, in part? There's a package called arg, isn't there? Yes, this is by the Dart team. So what this is going to do is allow us to properly handle our, uh, command line arguments. Uh, so first of all, before I do anything else, let me uh, push this so everyone else can, who wants to play around can, can do stuff. Important safety tip, always commit when you have working code. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you get a different working code, just commit it. Commits are really, really, really cheap. Lost. Lost. <laughs> you can always take them out later with a rebase, but at least always, as soon as you get anything changed okay. and it works still, commit. So this should be it. Yep, that's, that's all posted. So there you go. So that's great. Now, um, so I should be able to do like look. Yep. And uh, take two. Taken. Um, what else can we do? Pray. The worship has not re been rewarded. Oh. Okay. Yes, I'm sure I want to quit. You scored. Oh, I'm a rank of amateur. Oh, no. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I, I haven't pushed the, to just be clear, I haven't pushed the, the, the code for the Lost Kingdom by John Ripley. However, you can download it. If you want to try test this out yourself with the repository, you can download it from Web Archive. Um, if you go to this page, I'll put this in the chat. Uh, you can click on this link at the top and Web Archive. You should download a zip file from Web Archive. Uh, hopefully, there we go, and that will contain your uh, the the BF the BF code that we're running. I I don't want to publish it because I haven't got his permission. Is not it's it's got copyright on it. So um, anyway, um, the so that that's that's an interpreter that seems to be working to a good degree because we've got a you know quite a lengthy program there running. So. What I was just saying with the args, right? We'll just improve this one little step further and then we'll get back to some QA. And then if you want to, we'll end on maybe a bit of assembler stuff. Cause I know we've been going for a little while now, a bit, bit longer than I thought we'd take. So hopefully this was fun for a few people. Um, we'll just quickly do this arguments piece. So what we can do in the arg package is define an arg parser. And then uh, we add options to it. Add flags to it and all this kind of stuff. So um, should not work. There we go. Um, allow trailing options. Use line usage line length. I think there's like I don't know. I've I've, I've just been so long since I use add command. Add flag. Add option. I wonder if we can do like parser.show, is it show usage or something? Usage. Yes. So I think the idea is you do this. You know, I think you can probably check to see if parser actually has 
But we'll, 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 we'll get there. So here, if I run this now without any parameters, so let's just uh, let's duplicate this and say empty. Right. There we go. Apparently the usage is dash dash name. That's not what I was expecting, but I guess that's helpful. So I haven't provided any help with that, I think. So here we need to find an option. Oh. And the current. Right? So we could say like so I'm thinking what we could do is say something like this cell size, right? Cell size. Weapon size, I don't know. Oh. That's the VF cell size equals to uh, 16. Uh, it's just like a string, probably. If it was the 16. And then I think that what I'm thinking is we can say. Part of the part, you have to pass the part, I think. That'd be BF, not BG, right? Pass arguments. Arg results. Name of the command. I don't know. Rest. Options, there we go. Was passed. True if an option with name was passed. Well, there was a simpler way than this, but maybe add flag or oh, abbreviation instead of abbreviation. Yes. Um, add option. Here we go. Oh, cool. Passing arguments, and then you pass your arguments, you get the results. And then you can then see what the value is in the results. Okay, so this should mean that I can do results. Uh, first of all, if there's empty, then we want to print that off. Otherwise, we can get our cell size. Say uh, int cell size equals this. Try pass would probably be better. If cell size is not equal to eight, or cell size is not equal to eight, uh, cell, cell size of uh, So that's our command little argument pass. Then what we could say down here is say this of cells if cell size is eight cells equals just a thousand else if Cells size sixteen. So that sets up the cells. Um, now we can have a, a way of running this. So we run it with no options. Oh, apparently abbreviations can only be one. All right. Let's do C. Okay, there you go. Cell size. So this is the help. This is the usage. So what we really want to do is print out. Um, and, and that's a BF, not BG. Yeah, usage. Type on. Um, 
Also, we're 15 minutes away from the end of the show. We've got 10 questions queued up, so it's going to have to be a little well, we'll, 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 we're gonna, we're gonna, we can get through all that, and we can stick around for a little bit longer. Right. Well, that's it. So I'm going to push this, but but uh, I think that's it. We've got a working interpreter. Um, oh, default cell size of 16 invalid. What did I do wrong? Uh, and does not equal. Quite in one stream. Oh yeah. There you go. It's working. Echo. Lost Kingdom. Is it still working? So I think that puts us at, at here. So so I'm just going to bring this up the compiler because I'm, I'm pretty sure some people want to know a bit more about compilation briefly. So this is what I've done. This is what I did previously. And what I'm doing here, this is in Go. And I'll make this larger. That's a bit of me. Uh, how do I move this? Move to bottom. Come out the bottom left. Yeah. Right. Um, so what I'm doing here is basically saying output the, these assembly instructions in text form and uh, have a template for for uh, assembly uh, for an assembly uh, uh, program, whatever. So this is text form. And then what we do is what I'm doing up here is running a, a NASM, which is Netwide Assembler. So this is assembler for Intel. This is Intel. By the way, this is x86. This is the syntax that you see here, x86. It's uh, Intel x86 syntax. Um, yeah, and it's the instructions that the CPU understands. So this is like add to a register a certain value. Also, when we get increment, we can increment the pointer or increment the byte at an address. And these are literally the same things that we were just doing in here in these statements. The point here is rather than having, having uh, it be interpreted at runtime, what's happening is the output of this stage of looking at the code, which we'll get, we can get to after this. So I, I, uh, uh, I might try and stick around for a little bit if I, if I, if people want to. It's depending on if, it, if there's anyone in the, in, in the audience that wants to. And we, I could convert this to being a compiler which outputs this code. We run it through the compiler, and the end result is to get an assembly listing, very similar to as I just said with. Um, so we've got a uh, sort of. Here's, a, here's an example. So this is the output, which is reserve 30,000 cells, as it were, clear those cells. And then this is it. This is exactly the code you just saw. Increment, put character. These are all the different functions that you saw. I think this is like a hello world I did a while ago. Anyway, and then, or something, so I don't know. And then uh, at the very end, it, it exits the app. It's that simple. Um, this, this, is, this is a fully fledged, console app in, in this is very unoptimized right like you wouldn't do it like this normally but there's several optimization passes we could do to improve things but that's another time i think um so let's we get to some q a some, some actual q a let's do 10 questions in the queue so where are we let's 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 start at the top can you explain inherited widget in a simple way impossible Um, use reverb. So, sorry, use reverb pod instead. Yeah, use, re yeah, use, yeah, use, yeah. use provider, use reverb pod, use whatever. Um, yeah, so no, 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 I, I, I will mention so inherited widget is exactly that. So, what happens is you put an inter in, inherited widget in, and the uh, the it has a delegate that uh, sorry, yeah, it has is it delegate? I forget. Oh goodness me! I'm going to have to go look it up. It's been that long. Let's let's, let's let me uh, bring this up on stream. Let's let's learn together because I've completely forgotten my knowledge on this. So let's uh, let's uh, share share a window. I don't know. There we go. Well, is it accurate to say that inherited widget is the technology when you do something like uh, material uh, app of or navigator of? It's the way yeah. it finds that same thing further up in the chain. Well, yes, no. it, it, it was what advertises. 
So, so ah. when you create an, it's what advertises the values. Why is that not clicking? Oh, that's weird. There we go. Okay. Well, anyway, here's inherited widget. The uh, base class for widget that officially propagates information down the tree. There you go. And then this is what you call you call depend on inherited widget. It goes and finds it. But the point here is, um, here we go. This is what I was looking for. So, so is this update should notify? Basically, each time this each time the inherited widget is rebuilt. If the if this returns if this returns true, then it will it will rebuild all of the dependent widgets that registered using a depend on on how to do with exact type. That's it. Is that simple? You can use these for all your state management. That's literally Riverpod uses this. Um, wow, well, I don't know if Riverpod uses this actually, but um, a provider, provider does. Provider but not does, Riverpod. And um, there's plenty of other state management solutions which which use this. And each each um, it, the build context, by the way, is implemented by element. Uh, I need to find out if it's the right one. Yeah, this is it. Um, so this you will see down here implements build context, and this is that this is the class that has that depend an inherited widget of exact type. This is the function that actually gets used. And if we go look at the source code for this, what it does is it looks at a, a list. Oops. Find it, there it is. Chance that it just doesn't. Oh, it would have been in this file, but apparently I'm in random circles, am I? No, there it is. So there you go. So it looks at the list of inherited widgets, finds one of the same type, gets the element from it, um as the ancestor and if ancestor is not going on then depend on inherited element gets called and this is where it creates a, a hash set of dependencies for your widget and then adds the this aspect of what you'll be looking at to that list and the idea is that that's how you that's how basically your widget registers with the inherited widget and that's as simple as it gets really there's, there's not a lot more to it than this um the, the idea is that then the, when, when an inheritor widget wants to notify, it goes through this dependencies list and then calls did, did notify update. There's um yeah, I notify, yeah, notify clients, inherited widget, goes through all the dependents, does whatever it needs to do, and then does notify dependent on each one. And notify dependent is is what does the piece that actually the yeah, articles did change dependencies. On your widget, on on your state class. Well, actually, this is on the element, and then that probably called uh, then the implementation calls it on the state class. But the the, the, the thing is the same. I'm about to find it here anyway. I'm searching through. Sorry, I'm trying to be quick. Um, yeah. Anyway, there's there's plenty of reasons. There we go. So here on the element, it does mark needs build, right? And then that's going to rebuild your widget. Does that help at all? Sorry, I know that's complicated. I thought the details might be. <laughs> it's not really the simple way that you asked for. Sorry. All right, moving on. I guess next question. Um, do you want to read the? Does someone else want to read the questions? Or I don't know. A long tangent, but is it possible to keep persistent connection with Firestore? Isn't that what the uh, stream? Uh, yeah, uh, that's exactly what it does. Yeah. 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 So, so in so the yes, fight, yes, it's yeah. possible. <laughs> if, yeah. If you if you use any of the uh, snapshot streams that are in fires in the Firestore library, you're essentially creating creating a stream, a persistent connection with the database. If you're trying to do this in the background, well, that's not yeah. something you shouldn't be doing, and that's a separate issue entirely. So yeah. you have been warned. <laughs> we'll move on to something else. Yes. How to solve cache issue on Flutter Web? I, we probably um, need more details. I, I I'm going to tell you right now. That's because your server is not reporting the cache the, the cache headers for your content probably. So for example, like so so you need to go look up HTTP caching. When an when an image gets sent down from the web server, it sends a header along with it, which tells it how long it should be cached for, and should it even be cached. And that's the same with any of your assets, your JSON assets, anything in your assets folder for Flutter Web. If you don't send any cache headers down inside your web server that you're using, right, then they're not going to be cached. So in if you're talking about if you're using Firebase hosting, Firebase hosting has Firebase.json, 
and that has a configuration in which lets you override the headers and specify caching on images and such like that are a long period of time. That should it help, but go on. There might be one more thing. I mean, it's also important when, when he or she says about caching, it might be also a service worker caching issue. So yeah, that's that should be another yeah. thing. So, so you can turn off the service worker if you're if you're if you're just testing for the time being. There's actually I don't know if anyone's actually done a package yet. I did this back in the Flutter Hackathon, which was use the Dart HTML package to access the workers and see if there's an update. And if there's an update, present the user with a dialog box saying it's actually already. I think it's already added to Flutter three. Uh, so in the web, yeah. but there is the service worker is way different from the time that we've done the hackathon. Yeah, it was, it was a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hopefully, like you can do this thing where uh, it's the same as most websites do. If you've been on a, a web app, if you've been on for a long time, and and you come back, it downloads the update in the background that tells you your the, basically the application, the service worker has been up in this update, and to do that, you refresh the page. So you click yes to reload, and it just refreshes the. You then call um, window dot reload um, in the DOM tree, and then that will uh, that will. Uh, Reload the web page. Hopefully that helps. Which is the best architectural pattern? <laughs> Any we don't have anywhere near enough time. <laughs> I mean, the, the architecture. There's, there's no one specific architectural pattern. No. That's that's there is it, one right? answer to that actually, Simon. Go on. Uh, it, it really depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, the 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 the, the point here is. It depends on exactly what you're doing. Um, um, and the thing you talk about architectural pattern, there's not really an overall architecture pattern. There's patterns of code, right? And you can go look up design patterns, right? Object oriented design patterns and what they are. Like, you know, there's uh, bundles of those, right? And that's just how objects interact. But you can just invent your own little thing that works best for your website. Um, and you, if you're talking about MVVM, MVC, MVP, whatever, uh, pick one and, and stick with it and choose it and then just implement it, right? But most of them don't really fit with Flutter's UI system. Um, and that's why we go with the ones that work better with, with the way that uh, Flutter's reactive UI works, which is something like Block or any number of, of state management solutions. Um, which, again, there's a kind of a mixing of architectural pattern and state management solution, not the same thing. But, um, yeah. Anyway, moving on. Next question, right. Better is developed for Flutter framework. Could you please tell whether Flutter can be used for developing apps, GORE, maybe or 32-bit embedded systems or not? Four. 32-bit, I, I think, four. is too small, right? Um, can you please tell whether Flutter can be used for developing apps on 32-bit embedded systems or not? Um, it can. But it's not about it being the, the bit length or the processor that's that's the actual problem if it's 32 bit or 64 bit. If I remember rightly, it's more about the fact that the um it the processor ha the processor has support for uh hardware floating point. Um is is the requirement for for there's no there's no software emulated floating point in, in Dart. Um you won't let anyway, to be honest, it's it's archaic. Um the I mean, this, the, if you go look, it's uh, it needs to be. I think arm seven and arm eight. If you're on arm six, that's that's it won't work on arm six. Start won't work on arm six, but it'll work on arm seven and eight, as long as it has the hardware floating point processor. So this is like so. So if you go, if you're thinking about like trying out uh, Flutter slash Dart on embedded systems, go look at. Um, recently, I used the Raspberry Pi, so I'd say the Raspberry Pi four. And the Raspberry Pi Zero W2. They're quite hard to get at the moment. I know there's a, been a silicone shortage, as it were, which is just that all the silicone fabs are just full, full to production, right? It's really hard to get things to be produced. Um, the um, uh, There's also Flutter Dash Pi, which is a repo I'll grab out for you now. And that is um, that's a good source of embedded stuff. There's also Sony. Have a Linux uh, e Linux repo uh, for Flutter as well. So Flutter, uh, find it. Sony 
Uh, yep, that's the one. Flutter Embedded Linux from Sony. That they've been using it. I don't know what for. No one does, I don't think. But um, it's uh, embedded Linux. It's embedded Linux embedder for Flutter. Uh, basically, allowing you to uh, run Flutter on embedded Linux. So that's also probably right where you want it as well. So hopefully that helps. Next question. How can I write a Dart language grammar? Um, you don't. You don't need to. It's done. I was gonna say that you yeah, just need to so, implement it. It wasn't how can I implement a Dart language yeah. grammar? <laughs> so, so what what we were doing today and what we're talking about with the BNF stuff. Um, if you go look at the Dart spec, there's a BNF in the Dart spec for Dart itself. So. Um, I, uh, I'm going to see if I can quickly find the prints up. Dart and spec. There we go. Let's share. Am I sharing this? Can I bring this up? I don't know. Oops. Let's put this on one side, shall we? Be better. Yeah, so this is the dark language spec and then the formal spec. And in here, there should be, uh, there's a, there is a, there is a BNF uh, notation. So give me that. Uh, I know there's. I know it is because I've seen it, but I can't remember where it is. Type scope conformance. Normative references notation. So there's your kind of BNF kind of notation there, and what it's talking about. Uh, and other oh, eBNF. There you go. So and I just put the. I put the link to the uh, PDF there so you can see it yourself on your own screen. Yeah, if you want to open this up on your own screen. There is, and it's going to be the one time. Bored, if you can't sleep, you can read this and any oh, give it any paragraph. There you, you go. Can read it. There you go. Yeah. A variable fi final const var or type is equal to final followed by the type name or const followed by a type name or a var variable or type. And a variable or type can be the var keyword or a type on its own. So that there is the syntax for when you declare a variable in a statement, right? Followed by, if it's an initialized variable declaration, then it's a declared identifier, followed by an equals an expression, followed by a question mark, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. I'm not gonna go for it, but yeah. This, this, is, this is the spec, and then it talks about it and explains it. Um, and so far, I, as, far as, I, as far as I know, there's only one implementation of this spec, and that is the formal <laughs> Dart specific that you know the Dart team implementation of the Dart language specification, but every every language needs this so, so you can understand. I mean, this is literally what you go to as your source of truth. As a programmer, like I should be able to type this, it doesn't detect it. Most languages don't have the Dart analyzer. Most languages don't magically just tell you something's wrong until you press the compile button, right? And if the compiler's not not been implemented correctly to the spec. You might you it you might think it's correct and the compiler does not in which case there's a there's a you know disparagement there between this and it could be that the spec says it should and the compiler says it says no in which case you could raise an issue and say sorry this should work and it's not right to the language to, to the compiler team um but yeah one of the nice things point. that happened over the last uh, 10 years or so or what, not five years i should say is the common front end, which meant that the analyzer and the compiler and everybody were all using exactly the same definition for Dart, translated into an intermediate AST, well, and then they would spit out code for it. Or yeah, they would well, I spit really out like the one, of, one of the things I one of the things I really like is is we haven't touched on because we didn't talk about compilers too much, I'm afraid, but um, IR, which is uh, sorry, or IL, sorry, intermediary language or intermediate representation, it's basically your source code is converted into an intermediary form, and that intermediary form can be compiled into any number of different outputs. And this allows you to do transpiling, which is essentially saying I can convert C code to dark code or dark code to C code, for example. It's really amazing stuff. Anyway, we won't go there right now, but yeah, if you're interested in this topic, you can look that one up. How can create a container to host a Flutter website on a Dart server, which could be hosted elsewhere except G Cloud? And I answered um, this in the chat. I already said any Docker container can hold yeah. a, a Flutter stuff and 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 Dart stuff. And yeah. 
for a for a you wouldn't really have a flutter website you'd have a dart website and you could use mm -hmm. shelf or some of the other well, recent you technologies do, you can do you can use flutter web you do build and it outputs a directory oh. and you put that directory in your dart yeah. server in your docker container and you deploy the docker container right and right. you can do and that, that right can go anywhere docker goes yeah, that, yeah. Uh, dockers dockers can be hosted in thousands of places Oh, it's not just like yeah. Docker. It's like any container hosting or any platform yeah. that does contains, or True. in fact, any server that you can install Docker on, which is every server. So, you know, everywhere. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> That's why exactly. it's universal, right? So um, if you're interested in this topic, and I, I don't I don't try and self-promote here, but I did a, I, I'm doing a series with, um, with the Flutter, uh, the Flutter team and the Boring Show where we do this. So if you want to know more, Check the check after this. Check the YouTube link that I just posted, and that's the full stack Dart where we actually build a web web server with Dart and hosting the Docker container and deploy it on Google Cloud. But you can deploy it anywhere you want. It doesn't have to be Google Cloud. Okay, next question. Flutter gives no option to read a file from assets asynchronously, which forces us to use future builders. Oh, synchronously, sorry, that a, makes a big difference. Uh, synchronously, which forces us to use future builders. Is there a performance impact to this? Yes, your code works better. <laughs> <laughs> so so the point here, um, I'm not going to try and pronounce your name, but the point here is the whole idea of having asynchronous is so that the data can be read and your UI can continue doing something if you want it to. The fact you have a future builder, you can just display a wet screen if you want to. Right. If you're talking about the inconvenience of using a future builder, then what you can also do, and this is what a lot of people don't realize, is you can make your main function async. And inside your main function, you can await and just do a default bundle dot load and load whatever you want before your Flutter app even shows anything on the screen. Um, there's also defer. You can defer your initial frame and not even and, and wait for a future that way. And that also holds the, the default splash screen of the operating system before Flutter it starts up. So there's ways of working around the fact that you may not want to use a future builder in your UI. But to be honest, there's no practical usage as to why you shouldn't. Yeah. Like it's just benefit to the user that they can get some output. And if if let's say it fails to load an asset, how are you going to tell the user that without a UI? So yeah. You know, and then he question. follows up with uh, if there's no impact. Should every widget requiring results from medium heavy computations be built with future builders? Uh, no, that's going to start impacting your build time for your uh, for your individual frames. I mean, so if you're talking the, about the, the, heavy computations, yeah. yeah. I mean, the point the point here is that you don't want to you know as long as you're not generating your future in the build method, it makes no it makes no impact on your build overall because you'd just be continuing with the previous value that you got back from your future builder once it's completed. So not a problem. Um, but you said, should every widget require results from a mean to heavy computation to be built with future builders? Well, yeah, because I mean, <laughs> if you're doing any computation, you're running that off the UI anyway. I mean, you're not, you don't want to like freeze your UI whilst you're doing some heavy computation. This is just the nature of just doing standard like like uh application development that is anything you interact with the user as an interface if you're doing like a cli you just sit there maybe you just so doing something and then you just wait right but to be honest in most situations you want to present the user with something to tell them that something's happening right so that means any medium to heavy computation should have a progress on the screen in some fashion be it a spinner being a progress bar just being and anything right so uh, in short, there's no impact, and you should. You Actually, I have a question to follow that up. Uh, if I ha know I have a computationally heavy loop that it doesn't do any I.O. and it's just thinking about stuff, can I put like a weight future value zero at a point in the loop to yield the processor to other light threads just to say this is a good place to break me? You can if you have a sub function. Oh. 
So, because because a weight and an async only work on on a function level because they're coroutines, yeah. right? The way they get scheduled. Uh, uh, okay. So, so if you're in a heavy loop, there is no way of doing it. However, you can do something. You, there are other ways around that, right, Randall? So we can do you can do asynchronous for loops and have a stream. That's another oh. mechanism you can do. There is actually a uh, an async for in the yes. Dart specification, and you can right. do that. And in which case you can yield inside, uh, yield values back out. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. Okay, there are ways. There are ways. We should probably there go ways. to more details on that in, in code uh, in a yeah. future week because that would be cool to kind of walk through this to talk about that and also talk about the limitations of async a weight because uh, it sounds like you've got some things here that are worth sure. saying. So go ahead. Um, can we have an episode dedicated to custom paint and animations? You know who we have to get if we do that? The processing guy. What was his name? Uh, uh, Matt uh, Carroll? Super, super, super declarative, uh, yeah. Matt super Carroll. declarative, yeah, because he does processing. He's probably really good at painting by now. Um, yeah, we, I mean, we could do. I mean, um, oh, we could just do it. We could just do that. I mean, custom painting on a canvas is, I, I think it's a case of what you should, I, I, what I recommend you do to kind of learn this stuff is do a custom painter and a custom paint, uh, a custom paint widget with a custom painter delegate. And inside your paint routine, start trying to draw some stuff like a smiley face. You know, how do I do this with the canvas draw instructions? Because literally everything you see on your on, on your screen, on your phone, when you're running a flutter is done with that interface. Anything you can do on a canvas, everything you see has to be able to be done on a canvas. Full stop. And I and I believe uh, I believe Remy has uh, Funvas F U N V A S, which is basically sort of at a higher level. You're you have drawing stuff, and it kind of gives you the low level stuff automatically, so that you can do some really bizarre things. I think that's Remy that did that. I might be wrong. I'm not sure. I did see Funvest. someone else posted um, this animated like animated. Uh, uh, painted character. I can't remember. It was on Twitter. I saw just not recently, and it was really, really good. The guy had done all these instructions to actually make like this, like animation take place, all done with canvas and animation. Uh, but yeah, we can do that. Oh, oh, sorry, Remy. It's not Remy. It's uh, the creative maybe no guy. Creative maybe maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's him. But, but fun yeah, sure. is, Check it out. Yeah, we can look at that. Yep. Okay. Ah, can you share your first encounter with Flutter and what was your experience? That could take Go on. I'll, 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 Majid, do you want to answer this one? You want to... Yeah. Uh, my, my first reaction was, oh, that's what I want. It just works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, also, like the hot reload thing, like the first thing I was, uh, uh, you know, encountered, the hot reload was like oh, yeah. mind blowing. Oh, I was changing and it was immediately appearing. I was just like, oh, it's like magic, you know? Um, so that was the first experience. And also, like, uh, slowly afterwards, when I realized, it's, you know, a lot of people say Flutter is because it's unopinionated in terms of a structure, giving you a lot of flexibility and stuff. A lot of people don't like that, but I really like that. So because I can I can do whatever I want in Flutter, technically, in See, any way it, that I like. That, it's kind of a double-edged mm -hmm. sword, that thing, right? Because... When Flutter, when you first get into Flutter, you're like, how do I do something? Well, it's like however you want. But then that's not helpful, right? But as a when you when you start doing stuff with a platform and something restricts you, you're like, but I just want to do that. Can you just let me do that? And the answer is yeah. no. When you're on another platform, where Flutter just lets you do anything you want, and it opens yeah. up a world of possibilities and options that you wouldn't have available otherwise. So yeah. Um, how about how are you, Renner? What was your first encounter with Flutter? Uh, my first encounter was uh, seeing my friend Wim Leeler, who was a Flutter and Dart uh, developer relations guy, so worked for Google. And I came with him with an idea to came to him with an idea to write a book on Angular Dart. And he looked at me and he said, "You don't want to do that." And of course, he knew things he couldn't tell me at that time. But he said, "You don't want to do that." And then he dragged me over to his desk and he showed me. Flutter, hot reload. And I said, this is game changing. He goes, we know. 
<laughs> this was back in the early alpha days. I immediately went home that night and I had an icon on my phone that didn't come from the Apple store. And I went, oh my God, this is amazing. So on that same, on that same, so this, this leads on from your point, Randall. In fact, after that mm -hmm. happened or, or around that same sort of time, Randall, Wim, mm -hmm. uh, Wim Lima came to London and there was a, a Flutter Europe developer agency day was the title that they gave it. It was some really long title. Basically, they yeah. invited a lot of, of of mobile development agencies in and around Europe to come to London to, to come to London to their offices and to do like presentations and, and it's very like little conference basically. So uh, we went along and we were doing Android and iOS native development at the time. And um, when we got there, uh, I'd heard about Flutter previously. And as an Android developer at the time hearing about another cross-platform tool was just like, oh, it's, it's going to be rubbish. It's going to be like least common denominator. It's not going to do what I want. It's going to be a hassle. Like I've seen so many web-based ones. I'm just like, I don't want to know about this. Then Wim Lima came along and did a presentation at the event. And he did the diagrams of, of like, crossing the bridge and how this is different from the other ones. And at that point, I got that click moment of, oh, this is not what I thought it was. Oh, this is compiled to machine code. Oh, wait, hey, man, this is epic. This is what I want. And at that point, it was like started like harrying him with a bunch of questions at the event. And before I know that, I think it was that evening or the following evening, I had Flutter downloaded. We were building stuff. That was early alpha before it got released. And literally within a matter of three months, we 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 started the transition uh, to to Flutter. That was alpha days. We had a couple of products go out during alpha. Was that confident with it? And then the thing is, for me, like at that time. This is what we're talking about is alpha. You couldn't type on the soft keyboard. Sorry, sorry. You couldn't type on a hardware keyboard only on the soft keyboard inside the Android emulators with Flutter. Yeah. It just wouldn't accept hardware keyboard. So I added that feature to the to mm. the to the to the Android uh, Flutter host. And they got that's in there now. That's I don't know, it's probably been removed by now and replaced, who knows? But yeah. um that went in there, and it, that's the confidence I had because it's like if it didn't do what I wanted, it's open source. I could just add that code, right? So it didn't matter if it still be quicker and easier to write the code in Flutter than it would be to actually, you know, write it natively and still have these issues and have similar issues or, or pro problems with, with the native side. So that's um, one of the things I used to tell people a lot was even if you're only developing for Android or uh, iOS, it's still better to go forward with Flutter. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so so starting from that point, it was like, okay, let's uh, let's start moving. And that was in uh, October, September, October um, 2017. And then 28, it was, I think it was March, April 2018. I think it was March, April 2018 when beta came out. Mm-hmm. And then it was by the end of the year, we had Flutter Live 2019, no, 2018. I don't remember. I've lost track. And uh, and that's when version one got announced, I think. I think. I can't remember. Do you know what? It's all, it's all, it's all a bit blur. It's a long time ago. <laughs> but yeah, and then that was it. Like like everything just fluttered from then on. So, you know, that, that's my bit. Are there any other yeah. questions that have come up in the chat? Not, not really. I mean, it's one that came in after I cut people off. Let's see if it's still we can there. See if, there's, see if there's time. We can maybe yeah, here, grab something. Yeah, here. Uh, here, it's the, uh, the one from uh, Adil. Uh, grab it. Bring it out. You... Okay. Uh, I think I just do that, right? Oops. Yeah. Don't double click there. All right. I always get stuck and have no idea how things work when I'm, what I'm doing wrong and how I should I go about solving a problem or issue or an issue in an application. Um, welcome to the club. <laughs> Welcome that's to being a why you are a developer. <laughs> that's the literally you just described your 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 job as a developer is to solve those problems. Exactly. <laughs> and and the, you're talking about always getting stuck. It can be frustrating at first as a developer. You you can you can get into this myself. I'm never going to know this stuff. I'm never you you honestly can go down a very dark rabbit hole of thinking yourself never going to be able. So you might see what I was doing today. I have experience to be able to do that kind of stuff, right? So, so to me, it's, it's straightforward. And to you, it could be, oh, my God, what is all this stuff, right? And you gain that experience by doing more development. 
right so so you can learn the basics of how a language works and stuff but it's not doesn't take tell you how to put stuff together and frankly you that comes from practice and the, the tutorials online can only give you like there's only so much you can fit in a short amount of time so like let's say you've got like a, a, a I mean, some of the courses on YouTube that go like 14 episodes, that's the kind of content you want because each one's like an hour. There's 14 hours of actual content. I don't know what this, how good it is, but you know, my, my point, the point is, is the length of time. Like here, we can only spend so much time in the, in, in doing this. And we only got something basic working. You just, you can't spend that amount of time teaching someone. Right. So, so the best thing you can do is set yourself some targets. I want to do this. Let's say, place play i don't know make something or play or, or do something right? i don't know like how do i make a tetris clone go look up what other people did to make tetris clones how do i do that in flutter kind of start relating things and understanding and doing things and then you're learning as you go and each time you come up with a roadblock in front of you as soon as you get over that hurdle it's the yes moment of yes it works finally it works and that nugget is stored in your head. And every time you 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 get these things, you build up that knowledge base that you can work on. Um, and guys, have you got any input on this? Sorry, I know I'm just I, raving. I maybe want to add one more thing on top of that is, well, my personal experience, I also got stuck a lot uh, during the time that I've been developing and still I'm doing that, right? Sometimes you need to just skip and let it go uh, for a mm. while. And then... And, and then experience with other things. And, you know, as you go, you will learn more and more because the things that you like, the, the things that right now Simon has done today, that requires some fundamental understanding of programming. And you gain that once you do, you know, you, you know, the more programming, let's say. For example, he was just doing some kind of character things. And, you know, these are the stuff that if you start right now, you may not even under it's kind of like chinese to me for example uh, so but <laughs> if you just let it go for a while and try to keep that in your back of your head and always read upon it try to you know uh, investigate more after some time you come back to it and you realize oh the thing that i didn't know like six months ago it's just quite easy right now for me you know and that's that's happening to everyone I often will end the day with a problem that I just can't solve and I'm just not seeing how it works. And I get up the next morning and I'm in the shower and I go, aha, it's something yeah. about the shower is like meditative for me. <laughs> and it I mean, just lets me focus because I'm not, I don't have a distraction of laptops and everything else sitting around. I, thank God I don't bring my laptop into the shower. It'd be really trouble. Um, but no, I mean, it, it's like that. You kind of, and also, I think sleeping on it sometimes. Uh, exactly. Definitely. Your brain works, uh, brain works so, overnight. Well, I, 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 we have this saying in, in, in programming what, oh, is this your next never ending project? Because everyone has a, everyone has these projects that they start and they never finish. And yeah. it's very hard. It can be very hard as like you get so many open source projects out there that are never finished, right? And it's because as a developer, you start them and you start learning a little bit, right? And you got to the bit of information you needed. You learned a bit, and that was enough. The target was never necessary to complete the, the, the application because there's plenty of other ones that are better out there. But the point was the journey that you went on to get there, right? And that's the more important bit, right? And the the other side I say to this is, is imposter syndrome is, is definitely a real thing. And mm. and you you need to keep positivity and and don't let it get you down that you don't know something because it will come with time but the key is practice 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 um i like this comment so let's, let's flag it and maybe fascinating q a for every level also inspiring to hear hear your flutters thank you um thank you the, the um yeah the what was it yeah again something that i i find myself doing is honestly you get stuck on something take a break Right. You can you can keep working at it. Right. And you, until you're blurry eyed and you're just like, you know, and you eventually get there. You might even not even know how you made it work, but, you know, it works now. Right. You can get to that sort of situation or you can just I mean, there's not an either or, but you can you can step away five minutes, 10 minutes. Go go get a snack or a drink or take a walk. 
bike ride, whatever you want. And you believe it or not, because you've stepped away from the screen, you don't want to look at the code. The things are going around your head and suddenly something will click. You know, oh, that might be the solution. Mm. And it may not work. You may get back and put that code in that you think or do the way you think it might work and it doesn't work. But that leads you onwards. It unsticks you, right? Like you can start trying more things. I um, always say I'm making progress when I get different error messages. That's yes. always a progress sign. <laughs> like, like today, when we were debugging that, right? Something didn't yeah. work. That wasn't the end. That was, okay, why isn't it working? And what we didn't have is, a, is, is enough context to, to understand what was happening, right? So we had to peel away the layers and we printed stuff out so we could see what was occurring when. Time is a, time is one of those other things, right? Like in programming, like, like a lot of people don't realize time is a big factor. Like when something happens is quite important as to how it's happening. Is that, would you agree to that, Randall and Majus? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So, so, and it's even worse when we start dealing with, with multi-threads and we're not gonna go there. But but for mm -hmm. the most part, mm -hmm. we, even, with, even with Flutter and Dart, you know, Knowing that something occurs and something else occurs by printing stuff out and it is a nice way of getting a, a list of what occurred before something else. And that can help you identify a problem. Um, mm -hmm. And we talk about printing, which is a very, very naive way of debugging. But if you're doing what we're doing today, there's so many, it's just very unintelligible sometimes. The debugger. I'm not joking. I, not enough, I used not to enough say developers. that I debug, I used to say that I debug by adding print until it works. <laughs> right. The, the thing is, right, um, I do want to say this, not enough people use a debugger. What you should be doing, even if there's no bugs, put a breakpoint in your code, hit play when it hits that breakpoint, step through the code, step into the code, step out of the code and browse the code as it's running. Look at the variables as they change. You will learn so much by doing that, so much about what's happening. You wouldn't. You could step into the inner workings of Flutter and see how it's working. You may lose where you are. That's fine. You return. Just do step return until you come out. But you can, you can just all day keep doing this and you'd learn so much about everything so much mm -hmm. right um there, there's a couple more questions coming in if we've got five minutes do we want to answer them now since they're here eh, okay sure the, the one from Misa. Oh, okay this one uh, okay oh yeah yeah and then we'll what, what the, the one you were one talking one. about oh yeah, I see, yeah. That, that's fine you, that's fine um, let's do this <clears throat> um why does a, a, a non a, a not generic future t assignment work? I get the error of a, a value of type future t cannot be assigned to a value of type future t. I think he's creating two different t's, and yes. uh, I tried to give him an answer. This was a Stack Overflow question. I tried to give him an answer. He says that's not quite it, and I said, oh, "Okay, I'm gonna, I wonder what it is." Well, I mean, so I, I mean, honestly, it. what you're saying here is not possible, right? Yeah, but what what but the problem here is the texture representation of what you're seeing printed out is not enough, right? T can be defined in two different contexts, so when you're comparing those types, they might not be the same. But the other side of right. this is if you're if you're not using generics on a future, you're just using a future on it by itself. It means it's a future of dynamic, and at that point, you cannot downcast a dynamic to a non-dynamic. So, for example. If you're uh, if you're trying to convert a future of dynamic to a future of void, that won't work because because you're downcasting, right? But up the other way, you can work. You can take a future of void and make it a future of dynamic because a void is a dynamic. Everything is a dynamic, right? So just be well warned that 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 those things can get into a problem. But you know, without seeing some code, it's really hard to kind of give you an answer on this. But hopefully, maybe that helps. The best thing I suggest: more debugging, more printing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> How can I export a Firebase query to CSV? There's a package for that. <laughs> yeah. How wonderful so, is that? So in um, pub.dev, here we go, pub.dev, CSV. Here you go. Uh, and in here, there you go. So what this does is it takes a list of lists. So it's a list, uh, lists, uh, each list is a co is your column values, your cells. You give it a list of each row and then it converts it to a CSV file and does the, all the correct like escaping and formatting and everything else. And then you just write that to a file. Yeah, CSV is one of those things that's deceptively simple, except when it isn't. Yeah. And if you do yeah. it by hand, you will get it wrong. You will get it wrong. There's a, there's a, 
There's a bunch. Of, there's a bunch of different ways of using it, but to be honest, yeah. it's it's really straightforward. It really is. Uh, so the CSV package is the one you want, and yep. it does everything for you. You can even change all the settings. So like, not use tabs instead of commas, and use a have a tab separate file. Who knows? There's there's lots of options. But yeah, that's what you want. Cool. And you talk about export. You query the database. You get your data. You loop over your data and add it to your your list of rows, and then you output that to a CSV file. Um, yep. Right. I don't see anything I else. Think, so I, I think that's that. it. Um, yeah, uh, and Roberto, if you if you got five seconds, stick your Stack Overflow. Uh, oh, you can't stick it in, can he, you? I don't know. He tried. Yeah, he tried to paste it to me, and yeah, it didn't more. come in. That's just why he didn't get his. We have links to not stop spamming. I think so. Um, don't know yeah. if I have an ability to approve it if you post it. I can't see anything. No. Nah. I haven't ever so, seen um, that. Never mind. No, maybe next time. Yep. Um, send it. Use a hashtag and uh, and uh, hashtag hub the Q and A on Twitter, and we'll, we'll we'll see that next time. Yeah. As long as cool. it's away All from right. this chat. Yes. Cool. Well, Imagine. Thank, you, first, thank a, you much. Yeah. Thank you for dropping by. Dropping by. It was great seeing you. And um, no problem. Uh, I, I'll uh, I might give the compiler stuff a go and uh, at some point and push it up to the repo and uh, tw I'll tweet it cool. as well. Yeah. There you go. Right. Go, go. Have a good one. And uh, I'll catch you later. Bye-bye. See you everyone. next week, guys. See you, See you next, next week. week. Bye.